the hearing will come to order. Today we're going to have a video hearing with Ms. Sally Yates, who was the uh, acting attorney general for a period of time in January of 2017 and was the number two at the Department of Justice in early January 2017. Ms. Yates appeared before the committee on May 18, 2017. That was before the Mueller investigation really got started. It was before the Horowitz report about the Mueller investigation was issued. And I believe much has been learned since May of 2018, 2017. And we would like to discuss certain topics uh, with Ms. Yates. My view of Ms. Yates is that she exercised good caution and legal judgment uh, in January of 2017. And if people had followed her advice, things might be different today. So I just want to let you know, Ms. Yates, from my point of view, uh, you, uh, you analyzed the situation fairly correctly, and we will get into that later on. So what's the purpose of this hearing? It's to ask questions of Ms. Yates, <clears throat> knowing then what she knows now, which she had signed the Carter Page warrant application, because in May of 2017, we didn't know that the Russian subsource presented evidence to the FBI in the form of a dossier that was full of hearsay and bar talk that was eventually um, repudiated uh, by the Russian subsource. We did not know in May of 2017, as clearly as we do now, that without the dossier, there had been no warrant issued against uh, Carter Page. Ms. Yates signed the original warrant application in October and a renewal in January. And after the Horowitz report, we now find there were 17 major violations of uh, procedures and protocols regarding the warrant. And we'll give Ms. Yates a chance to talk about what she knew and when she knew it. Most importantly to me is this January the 5th meeting between <clears throat> Ms. Yates and the president in the Oval Office, 2017. We didn't talk about that in May of 2017. That wasn't part of our discussion. Since uh, May of 2017, we've come to learn now that there was a meeting in the Oval Office with uh, Director Comey, Ms. Yates, the president, the vice president, uh, Clapper, and Brennan. We now know at the end of that meeting, which was uh, called to brief the president about Russian interference in the 2016 election, and I want everyone to know, Ms. Yates included, that the Russians did interfere in our election. It was the Russians who hacked into the DNC and stole the Clinton emails, and the Russians were up to no good. That is not the bone of contention with me. What happened during Crossfire Hurricane is very much a concern of mine. So on January the 4th, 2017, we now know that the FBI agents who were investigating General Flynn uh, as part of a counterintelligence investigation had recommended that General Flynn be dropped from the Crossfire Hurricane investigation. The counter, the Crossfire Hurricane team determined that Crossfire Razor, Flynn investigation, was no longer a viable candidate as part of the larger Crossfire Hurricane umbrella case. A review of logical databases did not yield any information on which to predicate further investigate, investigative efforts. Now, this is on January the 4th, 2017, where the FBI was making a recommendation through a memo to drop General Flynn from the counterintelligence investigation called Crossfire Hurricane. We now know that Peter Strzok told Mr. Barnett, wait a minute, the seventh floor at the FBI 
uh, wants to keep this thing going. What happened next? A January 5th meeting in the Oval Office. We've never had a chance to talk to uh, Ms. Shates about that meeting. What do we know? We know that after the general briefing, there was a pull aside that President Obama asked Comey and Yates to stay behind. And President Obama mentioned the fact that he was aware of an intercept between General Flynn and the Russian ambassador, Mr. Kislyak. Ms. Yates was not aware of that intercept, and she said in her 302, she was so surprised by the information she was learning that she was having a hard time processing it and listening to the conversation at the same time. The President of the United States knew about the surveillance of General Flynn talking to the Russian ambassador, but the number two at the Justice Department did not know. The question is, who told the President? And did they have the authority to tell the President? Did they go around Ms. Shates in the Department of Justice? If so, why? The bottom line about the January 5th meeting is to find out how the number two at the Department of Justice was unaware of this event. And to the public, why does this matter to you? General Flynn was the incoming National Security Advisor. The election was over. Trump had won. He had picked his team. General Flynn was going to be the National Security Advisor replacing Susan Rice. Well, what have we learned? That there were intercepts between General Flynn and Mr. Kislyak, the Russian ambassador, in December. Flynn was talking to Kislyak about Russian sanctions imposed by the Obama administration. Those conversations have been released to the public, and he was talking to the Russians about, give us a chance to come in, don't escalate now, let's see if we can work through this. Here's what's so stunning to me. There were people at the FBI considering that a violation of the Logan Act. What is the Logan Act? It is a law that was written in 1799 that prohibits American citizens without permission from the government talking to foreign individuals about differences in policy. So I want everybody in America to understand the way the system works. The transition team of the incoming administration should be talking to foreign leaders <clears throat> and representatives about how the uh, transition will work and about policy differences. I'm going to ask every senator to think, have you called a foreign leader in your time in the Senate to express differences of concern about a particular administration policy? Have you violated the Logan Act? I consistently talk to foreign leaders about my differences with Republican and Democratic administrations. Have I violated the Logan Act? I called up the Israelis and urged them to push back against the Iran nuclear agreement because people in America will listen to you. I thought it was a bad deal. Did I violate the Logan Act? I called the Kurds and our allies in Syria, the SDF, and I asked them to rally their allies in Washington to push back against President Trump's decision to withdraw all of our forces from Syria. Did I violate the Logan Act? No. No one in history of the Department of Justice has ever been prosecuted for violating the Logan Act. Why are we having these hearings? to make sure that laws like this cannot be used as political tools to get people you don't like. And we need to clear up once and for all how the Logan Act works in America. I dare say that every incoming administration routinely has discussions with foreign leaders about policy differences and how things will be different. Ms. Yates, when she understood what was going on, was very concerned that 
a prosecution under the Logan Act was being contemplated. The question is, who brought up the Logan Act in the January 5th meeting? Whose great idea was this? Ms. Yates's 302 interview, where she talked about the January 5th meeting with the FBI, doesn't mention the vice president being in the meeting. But what do we now know? We know she was shocked and was having a hard time following the conversation because she was stunned that the president knew about the intercept with Flynn and Kislyak, and she did not. What have we learned? We've got an email from Susan Rice to herself on Inauguration Day, and it starts with, on January the 5th, the meeting in question, following a briefing by the IC leadership on rushing hacking during the 2016 presidential, presidential election, President Obama had a brief follow-on conversation with FBI Director Jim Comey, Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates in the Oval Office, Vice President Biden and I were also present. This is evidence coming from Susan Rice that in the January 5th meeting, the set-aside, the Vice President was there. What else have we found since we last talked to Ms. Yates? We found agents' notes from Mr. Strzok that Comey, the, the director of the FBI, reported to Agent Strzok, who was intricately involved in Crossfire Hurricane, and gave him a readout on the meeting. According to Agent Strzok's notes, handwritten notes, it says, VP Logan Act. President, these are unusual times. VP, I've been unintelligible on the Intel Committee for 10 years, and I've never. President, make sure you look at things and have the right people on it. President, is there anything I shouldn't be telling transition team? This is the director. Kislyak calls appear legit. Struck is telling us that Comey told him that not only the vice president was in the January 5th set-aside meeting, it was the vice president who brought up the Logan Act. We need to find out what happened and who was there, and this is the first step in the journey. And again, why does it matter? It matters a lot to me. We have oversight of the Department of Justice here. How could it be that the number two in the Department of Justice not know about an investigation of the incoming National Security Advisor and the President did? Who at the FBI, the Department of Justice, went around Ms. Yates to tell the President about the investigation? Whose idea was it to suggest that the interaction between Flynn and Kislyak was a violation of the Logan Act. If that's going to be the standard for this country, you're destroying the ability to do a transition. And to every senator in this room, we have all violated the Logan Act under that theory. Every one of us has reached out to some foreign government to show differences with the current administration. The Logan Act has never been used for a reason. I think it was used here as a sham reason to find out more about General Flynn, who the Obama administration did not like. So the bottom line is, when this is over, we need to fix it. We need to make sure going forward in the next transition, no matter who wins, that you can talk with foreign leaders without being afraid of going to jail. General Flynn wasn't talking to the Russians about, hey, pay my house off, give me money. He was talking to the Russians about, don't escalate the sanctions, fight, give us a chance to come in and we'll start over. My God, if that's a violation of the law, God help us all. And to her credit, Sally Yates did not want to go down that road. General Flynn was interviewed on January the 24th by the FBI without her permission 
against her counsel. She recommended that the Department of Justice notify the, uh, the current administration about the concerns they have with General Flynn, that the right thing to do would be to call McGahn and the Trump administration and tell them about the concerns they had about General Flynn. The FBI went down a different path. The FBI calls Flynn and suggests to him that you don't need a lawyer, that we just want to talk to you, we want to get it over quickly. Do you mind meeting with us? And when Flynn said, I'd like my lawyer, says, no, if you do that, we have to go way up to the chain. That will slow things down. And what did Flynn tell McCabe? Well, you've got the transcript. You know what I said. If there was a violation of the Logan Act, you had the transcript. Why did you need to talk to him? They were going to manufacture a crime, not try to figure out what he did. That's my view. We'll see if over time that matters. I'll end on this. If it followed Mrs. Yates' advice and gone to the White House to tell them about their concerns the way you should have done it, because she said what happened with the FBI was problematic and inconsistent with what should have happened. Been a lot of heartache saved in this country. So we're going to keep pressing on to find out what happened in that January 5th meeting. And we're going to try to fix this so it never, ever happens again. Folks, I'll end with this. The Obama administration, Department of Justice, had one view of the Logan Act. The FBI had another view of the Logan Act. But the thought that the Logan Act could be used against the incoming national security advisor who was talking to the Russians about different policy, that that could be used as a basis for an interview, that that could be a crime, should shock us all. Because if it can happen to General Flynn, it can happen to everybody on this committee, because we do this all the time. Now, swear Ms. Yates in. Could you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that testimony about to get this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but truth, so help you God? Thank you. You may make your opening statement, Ms. Shanks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned shock value that is shocking what the Russians did. I agree. We need to stop it. Did you read the Horowitz report, Ms. Shates? I did. Were you shocked by it? I certainly was shocked, yes. Uh, I think that the conduct that was reflected there... So let's talk terrible. about that conduct right quick. We're talking about using a document that came from a Russian subsource to get a warrant against an American citizen repeatedly that was full of garbage. Does that bother you? Well, I'm not sure that I Does it bother you that the FISA court rebuked the Department of Justice and the FBI regarding the Carter, Carter Page warrant application? Senator, I believe that the Department of Justice and the FBI have a duty of candor with the FISA court. That do you was believe they fulfill that duty? No, I do not believe that they did. I okay. think that there were... As a matter of fact, a you signed that program. warrant application in October and January. Is that correct? That's right. Knowing now... Knowing then what you know now, would you sign that application? Senator, I would never sign any document. So I take that to be no, no because that document was a fraud. Is that a fair statement? If you knew then what you know now, you wouldn't have signed it? I wouldn't sign anything that I knew to contain errors or omissions. Well, did that contain errors and admissions? Yeah, and I would never knowingly sign a document. Right. I, I didn't do that in the 27 years. I, I believe you didn't bank. know. I believe you didn't know that what you signed was wrong. The question is, if you had known, you wouldn't have signed it. Is that correct? No, if I had known that it contained incorrect information, I, I certainly wouldn't have signed it. Thank you. And do you agree with me it did contain incorrect information? I, I know that now based on the horror which report. That's all I'm trying to say. I'm not saying that you lied to the court. I'm saying you signed something that was a lie and you didn't know it. Now let's talk about the January 5th meeting. Uh, was the vice president there? Yes, he was. Okay. 
Did he mention the Logan Act? You know, I don't remember the vice president saying much of anything, Miss Me. So you don't remember him mentioning the Logan Act? No, I don't. Did anybody mention the Logan Act? I have a vague memory of Director Comey mentioning the Logan Act. Okay, what I'm was he mentioning sure. the Logan Act think. about? In what context? Well, that's, I'm not sure if he mentioned that in the Oval Office meeting or in the meeting that What do you think about the... Mr. Mr. Chairman, let her answer the question. Uh, Just because it's a woman testifying doesn't mean she has to be cut yeah, off. Yeah, thanks a lot, answer. Senator Lee. I really appreciate that. You're very constructive. So here's my question. Was the Logan Act mentioned in the meeting? I don't, I recall Director Comey mentioning it at some point, but I'm not sure about Senator Graham, and I want to be oh, That's fair, concerned. that's fair. I, uh, I, you don't know if it's mentioned in the meeting or not. Do you believe no, the con- no, I do recall Director Comey mentioning it at some point. I'm not sure. Right, no, I got you. I got you. Or in the discussion he and I had. No, I got you. That's all I'm trying to say. So here's the question. Did uh, General Kislak's behavior amount to a violation of the Logan Act, in your opinion? It certainly could have been a technical violation, but that was not the focus of the FBI or us, that we were really focused on a counterintelligence investigation. Well, uh, do you realize on January the 4th, the FBI recommended to drop General Flynn from Crossfire Hurricane? I understand. Well, I know that now. I didn't know that at so, the but, time. But here's my point. Okay. Ms. Yates, on January the 4th, the FBI said there's no reason to keep looking at General Flynn. On January the 5th, you have a meeting with the FBI director where you believe he mentions the Logan Act in regard to General Flynn. Is that correct? What I understand, Senator Graham, is that, and I didn't know at the time because I wasn't privy to the FBI's um, internal documentation of the counterintelligence investigation. Did you even know what was going on? Not specifically with respect to General Flynn, no. no. So I you did not know the FBI had a counterintelligence investigation of General Flynn? No, I did not until... So here's, until my, here's my question. The, the January 24th interview by General Flynn, by two FBI agents, did you authorize that interview? No, I did not. Did you counsel the FBI? I don't believe that there was a legitimate basis for that. Say that again, I'm sorry. I didn't authorize that interview because I wasn't told about it in advance. But that's not the same thing as saying that I don't okay. believe that there was a legitimate basis for it. So you believe there was a legitimate basis for the interview? Yes, I did. What was that basis? Well, at the time, Senator Graham, we were in a situation where we had evidence that the Russians were attempting to influence the election. To the election was over. Right. If you give me just a second here, I, can, uh, I think I can lay it out for you. No, um, no. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask questions, and you're going to give me answers. What was the basis of the General Flynn interview? Was it part of Crossfire Hurricane? My understanding, yes, it was. The, they just the recommended was, to drop him from Crossfire Hurricane the day before. Was it part and of that was before they had information please, about right. the calls with the CIA. Please, please, we're talking now about the interview of January 4th. Was it to determine if there was a violation of the Logan Act? Was that the basis of the interview? No, that was, it was not about the Logan Act per se. It was to find out about his conversations that he had Didn't had you have the transcript of his conversations? Provided, that he was providing false information. Did, 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 did you have the transcripts of the conversation between the National Security Advisor and at, the at Russian At some investor? point, I know we had what we call the cuts at that point. The FBI agents may have had the actual transcripts. So was this a counterintelligence investigation of the phone call? This was a counterintelligence investigation of the Trump campaign's potential um, uh, relationship with the Russians. That makes no sense. On January the 4th, they recommend to drop Flynn. They mentioned the Logan Act, and you advised against prosecuting the Logan Act. Is that true? 
we never made an official decision about whether we were going to do it, but I think it was unlikely, certainly unlikely, that we would pursue a prosecution. And, that and, was not our primary yeah, concern. Yeah, it was not so, a low act violation. It was a counterintelligence concern. Okay, here's what I want to understand. is a counterintelligence investigation that led to the interview. You didn't authorize the interview. As a matter of fact, you wanted to go to the White House and tell them about the problem, didn't you? That's right. I did. I thought that that was the more immediate issue. And when you when, when you heard about the interview, you got upset, didn't you? I was upset that Director Comey didn't coordinate that with us and acted unilaterally. Yes, I was. Okay. Did Comey go rogue? Then you could use that term. Yes. Finally. But it was so as to the so wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Thank you. Thank you. So here's the point I'm trying to make. Did I violate the Logan Act when I called the Israelis up and suggested that you need to come out against the Iranian nuclear deal because I think it's bad for the United States and Israel, even though that was the policy of the Obama administration? If you were doing that as a representative of the government, um, while the Obama administration was, was in I'm in not place, part of the Obama administration. No, I, I understand that, but, you know, I think the Logan Act is a reflection of, of our country's long My question policy. is, would a United States senator, in your view, violate the Logan Act if they reached out to a foreign government to express a contrary view of foreign policy? If you were negotiating on behalf of the U.S. government, you may. But, Senator, I have to tell you, the whole prism here... What? Um, you well, have, uh, that this is all about the Logan Act is just not why how did we somebody made bring it up why did they mention the Logan Act if it's not about the Logan Act because it as I was trying to say just a minute ago that's a reflection of our long-standing policy in the United did, States that you have is one it, president at a time and this wasn't it, just a is it the long-standing policy of the United States that an incoming administration can't talk to foreign leaders about change in policy you can certainly talk to foreign leaders about a potential change in policy in the future, but this wasn't any policy. This was undercutting the sanctions of the U.S. You had one administration leaving in two weeks, and you had a new administration coming in urging them, don't escalate. And to anybody who thinks that's a violation of the Logan Act, that is stunning as hell. That means you can't really talk to anybody you can't hit the ground running, so I just don't understand where the Logan Act came up. And I do believe very deeply that you were surprised that the president knew about the intercept and you didn't. Who told the president of the United States about the intercept between Kislyak and Flynn? I don't know, but it doesn't surprise me Have at all. Have you ever asked I anybody? No, because I, that, I would expect that the president would know about a, a national security trial. But you didn't know. You right, were surprised you didn't know. Who in the FBI surprised. went around you to tell the president? I don't know that the FBI well, Did you ever ask that. Comey coming out, hey, have you been talking to the president about this and not talking to me? No, what I asked him was why he knew about it and I didn't and he had What told. did he tell the president about it or do you know? I don't know who told the president. You never asked Comey, did you tell the president about this investigation? No, because, Senator, my concern was not that the president knew. It was not only entirely appropriate, you but You seem very was, surprised and shocked that he knew and you didn't. Right, because Director Comey was part of the Department of Justice, yeah. and I expect... Him so to here's tell a me question, that. final but question. But it turned out, here's to final be fair question. to Director Comey, they had told the National who, Security. Who's the most likely person to tell the president about the investigation it wasn't about an investigation about Senator. the intercept about, about the intercept it was uh, i can't tell you who was the most wouldn't likely. it be comey didn't he pull comey aside i think this information was shared with the intelligence community. do you think it'd be good to ask comey about that mr chairman give her a chance to answer I'm, you, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't hear your last question. I'm sorry. Do you believe the most logical person to tell the president about the intercept was Comey? He's in charge of the investigation. Well, first, Director Comey wasn't talking to the president about an investigation. About and the second, intercept. 
about the intercept. I don't know if it was Comey or the director of national intelligence or who it was. It could have been. Would the director know. of national intelligence be investigating a violation of the Logan Act? Because the president, when the Russians so inexplicably reversed course. Here's my question. Would the intelligence community be investigating a violation of the Logan Act? Senator, is that I'm appropriate? Sure is that appropriate? I don't know how many times I can say that that wasn't the prism. It was a counterintelligence threat. No, you keep there saying there was no. Well, he was dropped from the investigation on January the fourth. They that, talk that about the Logan Act. This makes no sense that you didn't know and the president did. And I'm trying to find out how the president knew and you didn't. And you don't. You, you still can't tell me that. Is that fair to say? And Senator, you won't let me finish the sentence where Please. I want to tell you. My understanding is, is that the agents had suggested that the specific case on General Flynn, because before they knew about the conversations with Ambassador Kisley. Still don't get it, but thank you. Michael Flynn uh, pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI about his conversations with Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak. He also lied to Vice President Pence, who repeated Flynn's lies on national television. You've explained that this made Flynn susceptible to Russian blackmail. The Justice Department now says that the Flynn case should be dismissed because his lies were not material to a legitimate investigation. Do you agree? Why or why not? Thank you, Senator Feinstein. Well, you know, I would be hard pressed to be able to, to think of an interview that would have been more material at this point of the counterintelligence investigation that the FBI was conducting to try to be able to get to the bottom of whether there were any individuals, um, U.S. citizens or and those associated with the Trump campaign who were working with the Russians. Um, so the materiality of this was squarely um, right on point. We had a national security advisor after the Russians had attempted to put a thumb on the scale for, uh, on our election who rather than when he spoke with the Russian ambassador telling him, stay out of our elections, keep your, your nose and your paws out of it, even if they want to reset going forward, but to, to rebuke him and to let him know that we will not tolerate their country trying to intervene and pick our president. Not only did he not do that, he was making nice with them. And then on top of that, we well, had the very- Could I stop you for a moment? The question was, um, are you saying that the Flynn case should be dismissed because the lies were not material to a legitimate investigation? No, I think, Senator, they were absolutely material to a legitimate investigation. Right. And this then investigation what, was... Sorry. Then I, I guess I'm not understanding what you're saying. Could you try was, it once again? Was, this is, sure, I'll try it again. I was, was trying to lay out for you, Senator, what the situation was at the time that General Flynn was interviewed. And that was we had General Flynn engaging in discussions with the Russian ambassador that were essentially neutering the American sanctions. And that is a very curious thing to be doing, particularly when the Russians had been acting to benefit President Trump. And then he is covering it up. He's lying about it. So the agents understandably needed to understand what the relationship was here between General Flynn and the Russians. And to try to find out from him who else might have been involved in this. And had General Flynn been honest when the agents came to him and had he admitted what he had said, then the agents would have found out what they actually, what the Mueller investigation discovered later. And that is, is that General Flynn was not acting on his own. And these were not conversations that were just off the top of his head, but rather he had been coordinating all of this with his deputy national security advisor who was at Mar-a-Lago with other transition team members. And it was a very deliberate planned um, set of conversations with the Russian ambassador to essentially tell them 
don't worry about it. Things are going to change once we're in place. Okay. Now, when you so testified to this committee on May 18th, 2017, you said that Michael Flynn's lies to Vice President Pence about his conversations with Russian Ambassador Kislyak made Flynn vulnerable to Russian blackmail. And, quote, to state the obvious, you do not want your national security advisor compromised by the Russians, end quote. You also said that Flynn's underlying conduct was problematic in and of itself, but you could not go further because it was classified. Transcripts of Flynn's calls with Ambassador Kislyak have now been declassified and released publicly. So why was Flynn's underlying conduct problematic? That's conduct problematic because he was, as I've mentioned, neutering the sanctions that were imposed by the Obama administration on a foreign adversary who was trying to intervene in our election. General Flynn recognized himself that these discussions were problematic, but he admitted to the FBI agents later when he was when he was cooperating with them that he didn't even write down his conversations with the Russian ambassador when he sent a text back to Ms. McFarland because he knew that those discussions would be viewed as interfering with the foreign policy of the Obama administration and that would be a problem. That's also why he lied about it and covered it up. So if General Flynn didn't think he was doing anything problematic, then he wouldn't have had a need to cover it. Is it possible that Flynn lied to the FBI about his calls with Kislyak to conceal the fact that the Trump administration did not plan to hold Russia accountable for interfering in the election? That is certainly part of what the FBI needed to be talking to General Flynn about, was to find out why he had these discussions, who else was part of them, and what was behind it. But unfortunately, General Flynn was not truthful with them, so they weren't able to do that. That, again, goes to the materiality. Inspector Horowitz confirmed that the Crossfire Hurricane investigation was opened at the end of July 2016, when the FBI was told by Australia, a trusted ally and intelligence partner, that the Trump campaign advisor, George Papadopoulos, had advanced knowledge that Russia was planning to release stolen emails to harm Clinton and help Trump. The FBI learned this shortly after WikiLeaks released nearly 20,000 emails stolen by Russia from DSC, DNC computers. Wasn't there some obligation for the FBI to investigate, to learn what Russia was doing and who was involved? Absolutely, Senator. It was really startling information. You know, the FBI, as part of the intel community, was already working, trying really hard to be able to get to the bottom of Russian interference and to address issues like attribution on the DNC um, hack. And then when they learned from the friendly foreign government that someone that affiliated with the Russians had actually approached a foreign policy advisor of the Trump campaign and had told him that the Russians had dirt on Hillary Clinton in the form of thousands of emails that could be released anonymously and wanted to know if, if the campaign was interested in this. When they found out this information had come in in May and then it actually happened, the emails were then dumped by WikiLeaks in July. This was something that I think everyone would recognize that you, that you have to get to the bottom of. This May, the Justice Department moved to dismiss the case against Michael Flynn, who pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI. The lead prosecutor resigned from Flynn's, and District Court Judge Emmett Sullivan took the unusual step of appointing an outside lawyer, former Judge John Gleason, to oppose the department's motion. According to Judge Gleason, 
the Justice Department's effort to dismiss Flynn's case is highly irregular and, quote, a gross abuse of prosecutorial power, end quote, in order to, quote, benefit a political ally of President Trump. Do you agree that the department's motion to dismiss Flynn's case is highly irregular? If so, how? It is highly irregular, Senator. You know, I, I was a prosecutor at the Department of Justice for almost 30 years, and I've certainly never seen a pleading like this. And as I think I've already discussed some with Senator Graham and with you, um, from my perspective, there's no issue with respect to materiality here, um, nor to the government's ability to be able to prove falsity. Not only because you could look at the transcripts and see the black and white there in terms of it being false, but in fact, General Flynn had twice pled guilty and sworn that he was guilty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator uh, Gress. Ms. Yates, uh, thank you for your public service. Uh, you approved the first and second Carter Page FISA applications. Prior to approving, did you review each application in its entirety? I did, Senator, yes. I didn't, I didn't hear that. I did, Senator, yes. And do I need to speak more loudly? I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, I'm... Okay. You told me you did review them in their entirety, okay? It's, it's, let me, let me, to one, it's possible that there's some boilerplate language that's in every FISA that I might not have reviewed again, but I certainly reviewed all of the, the factual information in the FISA. Okay. Uh, number two, when you were interviewed by IG Horowitz's office about your decision to approve the first Carter Page FISA application, you stated the following about Steele's research, quote, while certainly there was an implication that he was doing opposition research. It's got to be for somebody. I mean, he's been hired by someone. My understanding was that the FBI didn't know who, end of quote. The inspector general said the Steele dossier was quote, central and essential to the Carter Page FISA. If it was clear to you at the time that Steele was conducting opposition research for someone, why didn't you act responsibly to at least have an elementary understanding of the extreme conflicts involved regarding his employment before approving the first FISA application? Senator, it's my understanding that even the FBI didn't know who had um, employed Steele at the time of the first FISA. But we were concerned because for the reasons that I had expressed to the Inspector General, logic would tell you that if somebody is out there doing opposition research, there's a limited number of folks that you might expect that to be. But the FBI didn't know, my understanding is at that point, that it was the DNC or Hillary Clinton. And so lawyers in the National Security Division had worked and insisted that there at least be something in the FISA that laid out what they speculated. And it's a very unusual thing to include speculation in an affidavit, but here they felt like it was really important to flag that for the FISA court and to let them know, even though the FBI didn't know that it was being paid for by the DNC, that there certainly was a possibility of that. Uh, in April 2016, President Trump, Trump, uh, Obama said, quote, I don't talk to the FBI directors about pending investigation, end of quote. In the 302 of your interview with the FBI, you said that in your January 5th, 2017 meeting with Obama and Comey, there was a discussion about Flynn, Flynn and potential violations of the Logan Act. According to declassified notes summarizing that meeting, President Obama said to Comey, quote, Make sure you look at things and have the right people on it, end of quote. How can you square Obama's April 2016 statement with the January 5th, 2017 meeting with Comey and Obama? Yes, Senator, and as I mentioned in my opening statement, that meeting was not about an investigation at all. And I can tell you that that is something that would have crossed the line and have 
President Obama or Vice President Biden or National Security Advisor Rice was in any way trying to influence an investigation, uh, that would have set off alarms for me. This was not about that. This was about the national security implications of continuing to share sensitive information with General Flynn, given what they had learned about his back channel discussion with the Russian ambassador to neuter the sanctions. Your January 5th, 2017 meeting with President Obama had two parts. The first part included Biden, Comey, Brennan, Clapper, and Rice. The second part was just you, Comey, and the President. In either meeting, did Crossfire Hurricane or the Steele dossier ever come up? No, sir. Uh, did you or one of your colleagues ever discuss Crossfire Hurricane or the Steele dossier with President Obama or Vice President uh, Biden? I know I certainly didn't, and I can't imagine any of my colleagues did. Okay, I have eight seconds left. Thanks to Attorney General Barr, material relating to Flynn has finally been released. Those records show the FBI planned to close the Flynn case in early January 2017 until Strzok interceded that the FBI deliberately set Flynn up to prosecute him or get him fired and that there was no der derogatory information on Flynn. When you were Deputy Attorney General and Acting Attorney General, were you aware of this information? Not aware that there, they had planned to close the specific counterintelligence investigation on General Flynn. And my understanding is, is that was prior to the time they knew anything about these calls with the Russian ambassador. And I was operating under the impression that this interview of General Flynn was in the context of the broader crossfire hurricane investigation, that being trying to discern what the connections were between the Trump campaign and the Russians. Okay, thank you, Ms. Yates. Why, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Yates, it's good to see you again. Uh, you know, we keep talking about General Flynn, whether he lied or not. Of course, President Trump said he did lie to, uh, among others, to Vice President Pence, and that's why he had to fire him. But, and uh, the last time you testified before this committee in May 2017, I asked about your decision as acting Attorney General to notify White House Counsel Don McGahn that then National Security Advisor Michael Flynn had been lying to multiple Trump officials, including the Vice President, about his conversations with the Russian ambassador. You supported informing the White House, even though some others did not at the time. You stated that the need to notify the administration became clear as the White House issued increasingly specific and emphatic denials that Flynn had discussed sanctions with the Russian ambassador, which of course increased Mr. Flynn's vulnerability to blackmail. Do you believe General Flynn was effectively compromised? I, I certainly believe then and believe now that there was a risk of that compromise, and that's why it was so important to get this information to the White House so that they could act. And the conversations themselves were concerning, and that was a proper basis to be part of the counterintelligence investigation. But you have to balance the investigation also with the need to address the, the, the compromise threat that presented itself most urgently. And in Doing that balancing, I thought that we needed to go tell the White House, White House right away so that they could act and so that others who presumably did not know that the information they were providing to the American people was false, so they would quit doing that. And I think you were probably not surprised when uh, President Trump removed uh, General Flynn. But do you believe that by encouraging Russia to not react to U.S. sanctions, Flynn undercut our nation's response to Russia's attack on our elections. I do. I think that's one of the concerns, Senator. As, as I mentioned, the purpose of the sanctions was both to punish and deter. 
And when General Flynn was essentially saying, never mind on those sanctions, we're just going to move forward, um, that certainly doesn't send the message to the Russians that we want them to stay out of our elections. It undercuts our efforts. It certainly does. Thank you. Now, some of uh, Mr. Flynn's staunchest defenders have argued that because the FBI suspected Flynn may continue to lie about his conversations with the Russian ambassador, uh, he was entrapped when he was interviewed by the FBI. In your view, is it ever entrapment for investigators to give an individual an opportunity to tell the truth about an issue relevant to their investigation? No, it's not. And actually, here, the agents even took that a step further. They not only asked General Flynn open-ended questions to give him an opportunity to tell them the truth about what had happened in his conversations with the Russian ambassador. When he indicated, when he, for example, at the beginning, gave nothing but innocuous points that had come up and nothing at all about sanctions or about the United Nations vote, they then tried to, to help trigger his memory for him and used, reminded him of specific things, sometimes even using the exact language he had used in the calls. You know, if you're trying to set somebody up to lie, which I don't really know how you set somebody up to lie, you don't generally try to help them out like that. Yeah, you either lie or you don't lie. Uh, last week, the Attorney General claimed the Flynn interview was untethered to any legitimate investigation. One, do you agree with that? And do you believe a legitimate predicate existed to investigate, interview Flynn in January, given what you'd learned about his December calls with the Russian ambassador and his subsequent misrepresentations of those calls? Absolutely, Senator. Well, I believe that the most urgent thing was to notify the White House. Interviewing General Flynn was really right at the core of, of the FBI's investigation at this point to try to discern what are the ties between the Trump administration and the Russians. Thank you. Um, and the Inspector General informed this committee the only surveillance targeting any Trump campaign official involved Carter Page. I will submit some questions in writing about that. But can you speak to whether the government was specifically targeting Flynn with surveillance when it intercepted his calls with the Russian ambassador? No, the, the surveillance was not of General Flynn. I am still not permitted to tell you what it was. In fact, we checked with the Department of Justice just a couple of days ago before I testified, because I would like to be able to specifically tell you what it was. But there was no surveillance of General Flynn. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Lay. Very quickly before I turn to Senator um, Cornyn, I want to make sure I understand this. The interview with General Flynn, were you investigating a policy difference between the Trump administration and the Obama administration? No, Senator, we aren't investigating a policy difference. Well, you weren't investigating a crime, were you? We were investigating a counterintelligence threat. Okay, is it a counterintelligence investigation based on a policy difference? It's a counterintelligence investigation based on the Russian systematic no, attempts to... No, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is very important. Your beef with Flynn was he was undercutting Obama policy. Is that what you were worried about? Well, what we were worried about was that he was undercutting Obama policy, and then he was covering it up. No, you hadn't, he hadn't even talked to the FBI. You sent the what? FBI over. Weren't you under, what, and there was no leak of anything. So isn't it the fact you're really investigating a policy difference? No, Senator, it's not accurate. There was a cover-up before this. In fact, that's what prompted my concerns was that he was providing false information to the vice president and when to others. When did you know saying, about that? that when did you yes, know about that? Yes, I did. That preceded this, Senator. That's why I wanted to go to the White House. This so wh why didn't you go to the White House and say, is this your policy position? It, the concern was not about the policy difference here, Senator. The concern was about him undercutting the Obama administration and then covering it up. Thank you. And, and Mr. Chairman, insofar as you followed up on my 
question that time. I should note that she has said before they're following a counterintelligence threat. Which was closed on January the 4th. And Senator, not, I'm sorry, that's just not accurate. It was not closed on January the 4th recommended to be closed on January the 4th, the day before the meeting. And the only problem here is that you didn't like Flynn changing the policy or talking about changing the policy. That, he had every right to do that. And what we're doing here is we're criminalizing policy differences. That's why Flynn got prosecuted, because they hate his guts. Senator Cornyn. Ms. Yates, let me change the subject a little bit. Um, based on your long and distinguished service with the Department of Justice, are you aware of any precedent for both of the major party nominees for President of the United States being investigated either for a crime or a counterintelligence investigation in the run-up to a presidential election? No, I'm not. Me either. Um, let me ask you, uh, during the investigation of um, Hillary Clinton over her email server, James Comey, the FBI director, had a press conference, as you know, on July the 5th, where he uh, talked about the investigation, talked about derogatory information collected during that investigation, but yet said no reasonable prosecutor would would prosecute that case. Did you know before July the 5th, 2016, that he was going to do that? No, I didn't. Did you know when he reopened the case after Anthony Weiner's computer was, uh, was uh, uh, looked at, did you know he was going to reopen the case? Yes. Beforehand? Was I can't tell you, and candidly, Senator, that was you know more than four years ago now, and I didn't go back and try to review any of that. I know I knew about it. I can't tell you whether it was beforehand or contemporaneous. With it. Would you agree with me? It was highly. Director Comey's conduct was highly irregular. I don't know how to characterize his conduct, Senator. You don't know how to characterize it, did it? Um, he was a, the FBI director is a direct report to the deputy attorney general, correct? That's correct. So from the time Crossfire Hurricane was opened on July the 31st until you signed the first FISA application on October the 21st, did Director Comey keep you apprised of what the investigation showed? We had interactions. We were, I met with the FBI three times a week on national security matters and also met with the National Security Division. Um, I certainly was provided with some information, but I will tell you, I don't think that, that the FBI was providing us with as much information as they should have now that I, I know more about the investigation. And I would agree with Inspector General Horowitz's recommendation that in matters like this, um, that there should be both consultation with department leadership as well as more thorough briefings. Thank you. I guess you would, you would, you would also agree that uh, Director Comey should have consulted with you and the Attorney General um, in the run -up, during the, uh, his dealings with the Hillary Clinton investigation before making those kind of public comments. Those, that violates the rules and norms of the Department of Justice, wouldn't you agree? It, I certainly think that he should have consulted with us, yes. He said he thought that uh, Loretta Lynch had a conflict of interest because of the tarmac meeting between President Clinton and uh, the Attorney General during the course of the Hillary Clinton email investigation, but that would not have prevented him from consulting with you. Did he do so? Well, did he consult with me on what precisely? I want to make sure I'm as accurate as possible here. Did he, did he consult with you on the Hillary Clinton investigation and his intentions to go public with the investigation and, and um, usurp the, the role of the Department of Justice when it comes to whether to charge or not charge somebody with a crime? Did he talk to you about that ahead of time? I, I, we did not have a substantive discussion about it ahead of time, no. Does that surprise you? I mean, you're the direct, 
you're the direct supervisor of the FBI director. Um, if he didn't consult with you or tell you what he was doing or you didn't, he didn't respond to your inquiries about it, wouldn't that strike you as highly unusual? It's not ideal. Not ideal. Well, that's quite an understatement. But it, it is an understatement, Senator. <laughs> okay, we'll agree on that. So on um, May the 9th, 2017, Rod Rosenstein, the, your successor as Deputy Attorney General, wrote a memo with regard to Director Comey's activities during which he said that Director Comey did violate the norms and rules of the Department of Justice. And he said since he had showed no remorse and was likely to repeat that conduct again, that he recommended his dismissal. Did you agree with Rod Rosenstein's analysis in that memo? Senator, I'm not going to weigh in on what a successor of mine, a decision that he made when he was in You're not going to answer my question. Well, I just don't think it's appropriate for me to weigh in on that. So, I'm, I'm, well, I'm not asking I'm you to. Welcome. I'm not asking you to weigh okay. in, Ms. Yates. I'm asking you to answer a question about mm -hmm. the highest levels of the Department of Justice and whether this is the new norm or whether Director Comey violated those norms and his dismissal was justified on that basis. You have no opinion about that. Senator, I'm, I'm not going to weigh in on, on whether Direct, uh, Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein's memo was, was accurate or not, but I will say that I was concerned at the time, regardless of how out of bounds Director Comey may have been in the actions that he took in, on the Clinton case, I was concerned that that was used as subterfuge for the real reason to fire. Well, it strikes me that Director Comey was out of control, and as his direct supervisor, I assume that you would be concerned about that, and you might have called him to task for that and ask him to change his conduct. Um, Senator Durbin. <clears throat> Ms. Yates, uh, welcome back. And Thank you. Let, and let me congratulate you before I go any further. Today marks the second time during the Trump administration that you've testified before this committee. That sum of appearances equals the total number of times that Attorney General Sessions, Acting Attorney General Whitaker, and Attorney General Barr have appeared before this committee in their official capacity combined. So congratulations. We can't seem to bring the Attorney General here, but former Attorney Generals are always welcome. Thank you very much for being here. I'd like to ask for a moment for a reflection on Michael Flynn and ask about the following. Flynn apparently had suspicious contacts with Russia starting at least in 2015 when he sat next to Vladimir Putin at a dinner in Moscow. Flynn accepted payments from multiple Russian entities like RT, Kaspersky Labs, the Volga Airlines, and he failed to report these payments on his financial disclosure forms when he became National Security Advisor to President Trump. According to the Mueller report, during the 2016 campaign, Flynn worked with individuals who claimed to be in contact with Russian-affiliated hackers in an effort to obtain Hillary Clinton's emails. Flynn also signed a contract to work with the Turkish government during the campaign, and he lied about his work for Turkey on his Foreign Affairs Registration Act filings. In December of 2016, Flynn had four phone conversations with Russian Ambassador Kislyak in which he urged Russia not to respond to U.S. sanctions that the Obama administration has, had imposed because of Russian election interference in the United States. And, and that is the policy difference, I think, that has been alluded to. At no point during these calls did Flynn express any disapproval of Russia's election interference in the United States. Ms. Yates, understanding that you can't get into classified details, can you tell us whether the administration was specifically surveilling Michael Flynn when it identified these phone calls with Kislyak? The administration absolutely not, was not surveilling Michael Flynn. As I think I mentioned in the opening, President Obama, it was, we were all trying to figure out why is it the Russians aren't responding now, aren't retaliating after the sanctions, as they had indicated that they would, and that's when then the FBI discovered the conversations with Ambassador Kislyak. 
So the policy difference here apparently was the belief of the Obama administration is that Putin should pay a price for interfering in the United States election by imposing sanctions on Russia. And what appears to be a phone call from Flynn, aspiring to be the national security advisor to the new president, tell him, don't worry about it. And you were wondering why Putin was not responding and considering whether this phone call had an impact on it? Is that true? That's right, Senator Diane. You know, punishing and deterring the Russians for trying to blow our election doesn't seem like a policy to me. It seems like that that's something that all Americans would support. Yes, I would think they would. Certainly someone aspiring to be the national security advisor to the president of the United States. Flynn later lied about his conversations with Kislyak to the FBI and to Vice President Pence, denying that he talked about sanctions, stepped down as National Security Advisor in February 2017. But before he did, Ms. Jates, on January 26th and 27th of 2017, you briefed White House Counsel Don McGahn about Michael Flynn. You shared the Justice Department's concern about Flynn's communications with Russia his dishonesty about those communications, and his vulnerability to blackmail. Is that correct? That's correct. Yet, unbelievably, after you had briefed the White House counsel about Flynn's vulnerability to blackmail and his dishonesty, on January 28, 2017, President Trump spoke on the phone for nearly an hour with Vladimir Putin while General Flynn sat in the Oval Office with him. Is that a fact? That's what I've read. I, I don't know that personally, but I have read that. Well, I've read it and seen it. I understand there's a White House photo showing General Flynn sitting in the Oval Office during that call. Ms. Yates, in your view, was it appropriate for Michael Flynn to sit in on phone calls with Vladimir Putin after you'd provided your briefings to Don McGahn? Well, Senator, when I went over to, to brief Don McGahn, we made it very clear to them that we were providing them this information so that they could take action. And so certainly it would be surprising to me that of all things, you would have General Flynn sitting in on a phone call with Vladimir Putin. And what kind of message, message do you think it sent to Russia for Flynn to be involved in that call? It, it seems like it sends the same kind of message that General Flynn was sending in the phone calls with Ambassador Kislyak, which is, don't worry about the interference. If you believe that Russian interference in American elections is a threat to our democracy, and I do, and most others do as well, then this approach by General Flynn is antithetical to what we consider to be the basic fundamentals of our nation. And a man, certainly a man aspiring to be national security advisor to the president should know better. Mr. Chairman, I yield. Thank you. Yeah, I, I remember the conversation with President uh, Obama and Medvedev, or I can't remember the prime minister's name. After the election, I'll have more latitude. I remember the reset button. So maybe administrations want to change positions with uh, different countries. It's not so unusual. But very quickly, for uh, Senator Lee, did you know of efforts by Russia to interfere in the election before the election itself? Yes. Did you impose any sanctions before the election? Well, I don't have authority to impose any sanctions. What did you do to try to stop the Russians before the election? Oh, there was a lot, Senator. I think you may recall in October, there was an intelligence briefing, a public briefing. What did you do to stop the Russians? Specifically. What did I yeah, what did the administration do to stop the Russians from interfering after they knew they were trying? Oh, the, the, my understanding is, Senator, that the intelligence community and the administration, this is not something the Deputy Attorney General would be involved in. What did they do? What did they do? Did they, they, did they, they impose sanctions? They did not impose sanctions. Did they call the Russians election. up and say stop? I, actually, I do believe that there were communications with the Russians in that regard. Do you regard, agree with me it didn't work? If I could finish an answer, Senator. Yeah. There was concern at the time, and this was in connection with the October public statement that was made, that the Obama administration wanted to be very careful that it wasn't doing anything that would impact the election or be perceived to be impacting the election. Yeah. And so the information that was put out then 
was to make sure, for example, when the Russians were rooting around in the state election systems, to put out the information, which, by the way, there was no evidence that it actually impacted um, or that they were, were able to get into anything that would impact. I agree, I agree with I that. I want to be careful about that. I agree um, but with that. When they, when they were rooting around in there, the Obama administration was contacting the states and trying to make sure that they understood they needed to shore it up. My further understanding is they wanted to make a bipartisan statement at that point, and it were, there were folks on your side of the aisle that refused to participate. Yeah, but here's my point. You knew the Russians were up to no good, and you did nothing about it effectively. So we don't need a lecture from the Obama administration about being tough on Russia. You had plenty of knowledge, and apparently nothing happened. Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Yates, while you were the Deputy Attorney General, was it your policy that both administrations should be treated equally? That is, would there have been any reason from a Department of Justice standpoint to approach an Obama administration official differently from a Trump administration official? Um, no, Senator, we didn't. And in fact, it's we made that very determination when I was really insistent that we notify the White House about General Flynn. It was in part because I wanted to make sure that we were treating the Trump administration the same way that we would the Obama administration. Okay, so had that occurred here, what would that have consisted of? What would it have looked like had you treated an official from the Trump administration, the same as you would have in the Obama administration? Who would have been notified before any of this could have proceeded? Well, when you say any of this, we did do the same thing. We did go to the White House and notify the White House counsel about what we had learned about General Flynn. What would have been different, though, is with respect, I'm not sure why my lights just went out, um, what would have been different is that with respect to the interview of General Flynn, from a protocol standpoint, I would have notified the White House counsel in advance before that interview. Okay. Did anything like that happen here? I mean, was anyone from the Trump team notified? Prior to the interview, no. And that was one of my concerns about it, but this was a protocol issue, not a legal issue. Okay. But that was certainly something that would have been an irregularity. The, the, you've acknowledged then that the Obama administration treated the incoming Trump administration differently. The Department of Justice treated the incoming Trump administration differently than it would have the Obama administration. Uh, no, Senator, we were working really hard to make sure that we did not treat them differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I understand you were working hard to do that, but that wasn't, in fact, the outcome. The protocol was different. You deviated from the ordinary protocol. Well, the difference in the protocol here is that the FBI um, conducted the interview of General Flynn without a courtesy call to the White House counsel. Okay. When, um, when, you, told, uh, uh, attorney, uh, when you told Director Comey um, that there, there should have been a discussion about recording the interview and raising these things with Comey, um, uh, he responded with something like, you can understand why I did this. To which, according to your 302, you responded no, and Comey responded he didn't want to look political. And that you, uh, the 302 also notes that you were offended by that implication. Uh, can you elaborate on this? Uh, tell me why you were offended and, and what specifically offended you. Senator, she probably heard me say too many times now, I, I was a prosecutor at DOJ for almost 30 years. I prosecuted public corruption cases as an AUSA, Democrats and Republicans. And the way we do our job or did our job at DOJ was that you don't consider political implications in making prosecutive or investigative decisions. And I was offended by Director Comey's implication that he would be perceived differently than I would. Got it. Got it. Got it. Um, let me ask you, was, was it irregular uh, for agents to plan to attempt to, quote, get him to lie so we can prosecute him or get him fired before the interview, as stated in Bill Priestap's notes? Is that an irregularity? I'm sorry, Senator, I, I lost a Wi-Fi connection here, and all I heard was at the end, was that an irregularity? 
Yes. Well, would you mind repeating the question, please? Uh, uh, for agents to plan to get to, quote, get him to lie so we can prosecute him or get him fired. Well, certainly that's not an appropriate way for the FBI to conduct itself. I don't believe that that's what they did with respect to General Flynn. And I think if you read the 302, it's, it's pretty clear. About it. Is it irregular for McCabe to have pressured General Flynn to appear without counsel? Uh, I don't uh, really did pressure him to appear without counsel. Um, all right. Just to make clear, I want to get to the bottom of what went wrong. How was a FISA application to surveil an American citizen and a major party uh, presidential campaign approved with 17 significant errors and omissions. And no one knew until the Department of Justice Inspector General conducted an audit. An audit, by the way, that would have never been conducted had the surveillance not involved the staffer of a future president's campaign. Had President Trump lost in 2016, these significant errors and omissions would never have come to light, would they? Oh, I don't know that. I, you know, Inspector General Horwitz, I've known him for a long time. He's a very thorough guy, so I wouldn't count on that necessarily being a, a different result then. Were you, were you aware that agents were using information compiled by Christopher Steele at the request of the DNC at the time you signed either the initial Carter Page FISA application or the first renewal? I was, um, I was not aware that the DNC was funding it, but I think we suspected that there was a chance, but we did not know that to be a fact. And in fact, the Inspector General did not identify that as an error, which, by the way, not, not to quibble here, there were seven errors, not 17, and the FISAs that I signed, but one error is too many. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I can ask one more brief question. Were you aware of the concerns with the reliability of the information that was provided by Christopher Steele and what we now refer to as the Steele dossier before signing either the initial Carter Page FISA application or the first renewal? No, I wasn't, Senator. And I think a lot of those concerns come from the interview of the subsource that took place after I signed both the original and the first renewal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see my time's expired. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you. Um, Ms. Yates, let me ask you a couple of, I think, pretty simple questions, if you could um, hear me out here. Um, the first is that um, the sort of origin story here is a uh, telephone call between Ambassador Kislyak and General Flynn. Uh, you became aware of that um, in the course of regular counterintelligence activities, correct? That's correct. Were you surveilling General Flynn or were you surveilling Absolutely. Ambassador Kislyak? I can't, I can tell you what we were doing and that is surveilling General Flynn. I'm still not permitted to tell you what we were doing. That's still classified. Much as I would like to tell you, I can't. Gotcha. So we'll just let logic uh, follow through. It would not be unusual for a sovereign nation to monitor the communications of a rival nation's ambassador, irrespective of what, which nation you're in, correct? That's pretty standard counterintelligence practice. Uh, if you don't mind saying that, I'm just not going to hint at that. I, I want to stay really clear on, on the classification rules. But you're being really clear that you are not surveilling General Flynn. Absolutely not. So the next thing you know, you know of this conversation because you've overheard it. And the White House at very high levels, including the Vice President, is denying that that conversation took place. The conversation that you knew happened. What is the counterintelligence problem with that set of circumstances? A national security advisor who has had a conversation with a Russian ambassador that the vice president is denying took place. Well, there's a, a counterintelligence concern about the conversations to begin with, given the fact that he was undercutting sanctions against the Russians for interfering in our election. Is it a I mean, counterintelligence problem if the Russians 
Does it raise the prospect that General Flynn had lied to the Vice President and that the Russian Ambassador would know that and be able to exert leverage on the National Security Advisor? Exactly, Senator. And I was saying, and layer on top of that, that, that he has been lying There's a larger the policy President. question around it, but there's a very specific issue right there, correct? That's correct. And it gives the Russians leverage against Mr. Flynn, possibly. General Flynn. That was our concern. Is that That's it, the counterintelligence concern. Potential conflicts. Yes. So let me take you to a different question. You have been asked that if you knew of the errors and omissions that the Inspector General found in the FISA warrants, would you sign well, the warrant? And I think the answer that every prosecutor, myself included, must give to that question is no, of course, we would never submit to a court a warrant application that we knew contained errors or omissions. That is correct, is it not? That's correct, sir. But that does not, to my mind, as somebody who's been in that situation, that does not end the inquiry. The question then is, if you had been aware of the errors and omissions in the FISA warrant, one response would be to shut down the investigation and roll it up. A second would be to find out why the hell the errors and omissions were there, investigate the misconduct that led to that, but go ahead with the investigation because it remained predicated and worth pursuing. Both of those are possible options, are they not? I'm sorry? Yes, they are. Both are possible options. And in fact, if we were in a situation in which any error or omission in a warrant affidavit ended the underlying investigation, a lot of criminal conduct and legitimate investigations would be improperly brought to a premature conclusion, correct? I'm sorry, say it again. We're not... Yes, I'm sorry. That's true. And that's pretty standard prosecutor 101. If there's something that you think might be wrong with a warrant that you're being asked to sign, you get that fixed, but you don't necessarily end the investigation, correct? Right, and you need to find out whether there is other evidence and other information that would support them. But you would also want to get to the bottom of why it was you hadn't been told no, the correct. You do an interior, an internal investigation to try to get to the bottom of why you were presented a warrant application with errors and omissions. But my point is a very simple one. That does not mean the end of the investigation necessarily. In fact, this not is necessarily. not necessarily uncommon. You solve your problem and you go ahead with your investigation if it's properly predicated and justified, correct? That's correct. Thank you. And uh, on a stroke of bipartisanship, I agree with everything you just said. That's exactly the way it should work. Uh, and I want to let Ms. Yates know that I have no doubt that when she signed the application, she did so in good faith, relying on information to be truthful, and that she would not have defrauded the court, and I have no belief that she did. Uh, who next? Ms. Hawley, Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Yates, for being here. Why don't we just pick up right there? We can do because you know, the chairman says that, that he has no doubt that you had no intent to defraud the court. I noticed when Mr. Rosenstein was here before this committee, I'm sure you saw his testimony or read it uh, a few weeks ago, he said that he couldn't be to blame or otherwise be held accountable for the falsified FISA applications, the many material misstatements of fact, uh, because he just relied on uh, the, uh, the representations that were made to him. So we're left wondering, I mean, who exactly is responsible here? It seems that nobody's really responsible. Somehow or another, a federal court, a secret federal court, was actively misled, lied to, and presented with falsified evidence, but nobody in the chain of command is to blame. So let me just ask you about your own responsibility. Did you actually read these FISA applications? I did. You did? That's your testimony yes. today? You yes, told I the did. You told the Inspector General that you had no recollection, actually, of, of reviewing renewal application number one. Is, that, is your testimony today different? No, I think what I, was, what I told the Inspector General was I didn't have a specific recollection of sitting at my desk and asking questions about it, but I most assuredly reviewed it. 
You said that you did not have any specific recollection of reviewing renewal application number one. But today you say you did. That's great if you did, because I'd like to ask you some more detailed questions. I just want to get clear on this testimony. Yes, I did. Interesting. Um, now, you told the Inspector General that the Carter Page FISA applications that you signed off on and that you now say that you read and carefully reviewed, that uh, these applications, by the way, that contained multiple material misstatements and would later contain falsified evidence, you said that these were not a close call. You also told the IG that you thought that the application, the initial application and the renewals were appropriate steps and you didn't have any qualms about them. Or do you recall what the FISA court said about these applications? Yes, Senator, and when I was speaking with the Inspector General, I was referring to the applications based on the assumption that all of the information was accurate. What was learned later, and what the FISA court was responding to later, is that there were errors and omissions. In well, the, the, er the errors and omissions sure were there at the time stuff. that you signed off on them, were they not? And you just testified that you read them closely, so they were there when you signed off on them, correct? That's correct. They okay, let me remind you what the FISA court said. I'll just read this in the record. The FBI's handling of the Carter Page applications, which you approved and you now say you read, was antithetical to the heightened duty of candor owed to the court. The frequency with which representations made by FBI personnel turned out to be unsupported or contradicted by information in their possession and with which they withheld information detrimental to their case calls into question whether information contained in other FBI applications is reliable, end quote. Are you still of the view that these applications were not a close call at all and you uh, would do the same thing now? I mean, this was, these were appropriate steps, I think, was your testimony of the IG. Do you stand by that? Yes, Senator. I think if you properly put my testimony in context when I spoke with the Inspector General, I was referring to the decision that I made at the time based on the factual information that was presented to me and known to So us. you were a passive party in this. I mean, you, you did testify now in contrast to what you testified to the IG earlier, but you're telling us now today you did read the applications, but you were also duped by the FBI, and so it's for that reason you signed off on misleading applications that a FISA court said were so bad and so misleading, they call into question all of the submissions by the FBI. So you, you're a passive party. Is that your testimony today? No, sir. Senator, I was not passive at all. Then what did you do to actually exert some sort of control and exercise responsibility? And what, let me just ask you this, what responsibility do you bear for the deliberate and systematic misleading of a secret federal court? As the Deputy Attorney General and the number two person of the Justice Department, I was responsible for the actions of every single employee at DOJ, all 113,000 of them. That includes everybody at FBI and DEA and ATF and all the U.S. Attorney's offices and all the lawyers at the Department of Justice. I was responsible in that sense for the actions of all of them. So do you regret the fact that you signed applications that contained false and misleading material that a court says now calls into question their ability to rely on anything that the FBI says? Oh, I certainly regret that, that the Department of Justice submitted with the FBI FISA applications that were inaccurate. I think that is antithetical to our responsibility to the FISA court. I think it is also inconsistent with what my experience with the FBI had been in terms of of their preparation of affidavits and the accuracy. Let me ask you just about one other thing, Mr. Chairman. I see my time has expired. So let me just, one, one final question. I, I noticed that you, you said, Ms. Yates, to the IG, that you didn't know who Christopher Steele was working for. In fact, you opined to the IG that you thought maybe he was working for the Republican Party. Of course, we know from Steele himself, Steele told the IG that he, Steele, told the FBI in July of 2016 that he'd been hired by the Democrats. We also know that your deputy, Bruce Orr, knew that Steele was working for the Democrats. And the same deputy, Bruce Orr, your deputy, while he was working for you, was actively facilitating contacts between the FBI and, uh, and uh, Steele, and also between the State Department and Steele. How did this happen on your watch? Is it, is it normal for you to permit your deputies to facilitate contacts between political parties and the FBI and the State Department? Is that routine behavior? 
committing Bruce Orr to do anything. As the Inspector General found, I was completely unaware of Bruce Orr's actions. I'm sorry, could you, I, I, didn't, I didn't hear that. Can you repeat that? Oh, I, I wasn't allowing Bruce Orr to do anything. As the Inspector General found in the IG report to which you have referred, that I was completely unaware of Bruce Orr's actions. And Bruce Orr had no involvement from our side in any of the Russia investigation or the Carter Page files. I just say in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, that I, we, I seem to detect a pattern here. There's, Ms. Yates testifies she has no idea what her deputy is doing as he facilitates contact between a political party opposition research and the FBI. She has no idea that these, these applications that she signed materially misled a federal court. Just as Rosenstein said, he had no idea. Nobody appears to know anything in this government, and yet somehow a federal court was deliberately and systematically misled so severely that they now say they can't trust anything that the FBI did. If this doesn't call for a cleaning of house at DOJ and the FBI, I don't know what is, and I just know that Bruce Orr is still on the payroll at the Department Department of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Coons. Yeah. I'm Mr. sorry. Chairman. We're on a five-minute break. I apologize, Ms. Shates. Uh, Mr. We'll, Chairman. We'll take a break from Ms. Shates. I, I see no reason for those remarks. They're inflammatory. Uh, I, I think the witness ought to be able to respond if she chooses to. She certainly may. And uh, let me just give my two cents worth. I don't think they're inflammatory at all. I think it's the truth. Bruce Orr is apparently going rogue. You got, got her deputy orchestrating interviews and meetings, and he tells the FBI in November, you need to watch Steele. What the hell's going on over there? I don't think why we're doing this. I, I don't, since my remarks are the ones that are just challenged, Mr. Chairman, I'll just say with all due respect, we have a deliberate and systematic misleading of a federal court here. I don't think you can say anything more inflammatory than what the federal court itself said when they issued an incredible statement. I've never seen a federal court, let alone the FISA court issue, saying that they now had no confidence in any of the submissions of the FBI based on the level of lying. Well, everybody's to blame and nobody's to blame exactly. uh, is the problem we have. We'll take a five minute break and we'll let her respond. Chairman, let her answer the question. Well, Just because it's a woman testifying doesn't mean she has to be cut yeah, off. Yeah, thanks a lot, Senator Lee. I really appreciate that. You're very constructive. So here's my question. <laughs> 